morning, everybody. My name is James Bowman, and a couple of years ago, I started a project called the Game Duino, and I'll be talking about uh, um, how it's made, how we did it, and a few things that it can do. And this is it running the slides right now. So there's an Arduino down here with a Game Duino plugged into it, and it is generating the VGA. So my slides are running uh, 400 by 300. Uh, so I apologize for their lack of resolution, but they are homemade. Okay. So it started a couple of years ago. Um, I uh, made a circuit. Here's the, um, here's the circuit diagram. Uh, actually, no, this is the uh, PCB layout. This is uh, made using a uh, PCB layout program. Uh, you can make it yourself. Uh, you can have PCBs made. You just lay it out in a, in a uh, piece of free software called Eagle. Uh, you send it off to a PCB house and you get a blank board back and you can solder the whole thing. Or in American, you can solder the whole thing yourself uh, if you like. It's, op it's an open source design. So if you, have, um, if you have the skills, you can just get the design and, and uh, DIY at home. So then I had it running, and the big question was uh, what to do with it. So I decided to uh, see if it would work on a new site at the time called Kickstarter. And uh, this is me giving my, uh, it's one Sunday morning, I'm giving my pitch to the camera. <laughs> the kids behind me are playing with prototype A of the uh, game Duino, being, uh, having a wonderful time, obviously. And that's me holding prototype B, the one that didn't work very well, while I tell people on camera how wonderful it would be if they back the project on Kickstarter. So Kickstarter happened. There it is. I set a goal, um, uh, and which was a run of about 100 units, uh, to see if, if maybe there were 100 people who wanted uh, game Duinos uh, to work with their Arduino. So I just sold it as a board, an add-on board for people who were already into Arduino hacking and wanted to get graphics and sound output and make. Um, you'd probably have to describe it as 80s video games. Uh, so um, it did happen on Kickstarter. It reached its goal quite quickly. And in fact, it ended up with about uh, 500 backers which, which was good, but of course it meant that the production run was a lot bigger than I expected. Uh, and this is a picture of my kitchen table with, with just some of the units getting ready to go. Um, my house turned into a mini, <laughs> a mini labor camp while the kids had to <laughs> put things in bags. And of course, when you're dealing with, with maybe 100 units, you, could, you can do it relatively quickly, but when you're doing 1,000, it's, it's a lot. Uh, so we had a... Um, a lot of things to do, and um, uh, ordering parts from manufacturers is actually not that hard if you have a prototype. Once you have a working prototype that they can look at and copy, you can just um, uh, send that to them, and they will send you back uh, hundreds and hundreds of your units at um, fairly reasonable prices. Uh, it's a lot like uh, using a printer, really. You know, just send them the circuit and it comes back. And if it's manufacturable, uh, they will all come back working. We got um, about 97% of the things that came back actually worked. So it's not that hard. So this is what the actual hardware looks like. Um, if it comes off the manufacturing line, we've got a VGA connector. There's a sound connector behind that. Those um, headers are the things that plug into the Arduino. The whole thing is, is Arduino-sized. Uh, and there's a little bit of support circuitry, but all the hardware is in that central chip there in the middle, which is a great big, expensive FPGA. And that is uh, where all of the graphics and audio processing happens. It's an FPGA-based design. Uh, I say expensive, it's expensive by Arduino standards. I mean, the Arduino CPU itself is a, is a $1 CPU, so we're in the world of, of fairly cheap parts. Uh, the FPGA is pretty fancy. It's running at 50 megahertz 
against the Arduino 16 megahertz, so it's actually running faster than the CPU it's attached to. So why did I make the Arduino, the uh, game Duino? It's because people were doing game stuff with Arduinos, and they were um, um, kind of interested in making physical controllers, but Arduino game video output was all one bit. People were doing, um, uh, and still do, with their Arduino um, NTSC um, direct generation of signals using resistor networks, so you can get um, simple graphics running with one bit. Um, there's a, a couple of, that's as far as it goes, it doesn't really scale up. Colors are a real challenge. And the other problem is that the code to make it do that is actually quite complicated. You only get a little bit of time to run your game logic and then the next refresh comes around. So it's actually quite a challenge to do that and it's not a very appealing way to write games. It makes the um, Atari VCS look like a dream machine really. Uh, so that was the landscape before <laughs> Game Duino happened. And as I was developing it, uh, there were a few things I wanted it to do, which were the sort of test applications. Those are the sort of things you do with, uh, with the platform to make sure it can actually deliver uh, uh, some reasonable things. Uh, this, of course, is um, a port of the Atari bouncing ball. I'll be showing that in a moment. Uh, the other sorts of things are taking the classics and porting them to the game Duino, so we should be able to do all those things from the late 70s, mid 80s, uh, just the same. Uh, or even come up with new classics. There's a rich field of, of uh, licenses yet to be exploited from the mid 1970s. So, it's a retro platform. You know, this, the whole Kickstarter campaign was based on retro gaming, and that's a great um, hook to hang it onto because if it's retro, then any shortcomings are, of course, because of its retro nature. And, uh, they were, uh, programming in the 80s, uh, a lot of things are just the same. We still have uh, layers, sprites, and palettes. These are things that have really disappeared. Uh, from graphics these days. Now that you can just show an arbitrary image on a screen and update every pixel on the screen, uh, people forget that there was a time when computers struggled to show pictures. And um, these um, retro techniques are what you have to do in order to let a small computer generate an image and animate it on the screen. The Arduino itself which obviously we, we can't really change that. That's the CPU platform that we plug into, or a peripheral for the Arduino. But the Arduino itself is not that great. It's an 8-bit CPU. It has 32K of flash and 2K of RAM. So there are smaller platforms, but it's about the same as a Nintendo NES in, in CPU capability. So not a lot of room. Something that people had to do in the past in order to get fancy effects were just the same. If you want to do something fancy, I've got a couple of things to show today that, that use beam chasing. But really, there's no option but to go right down there into the hardware level and mess with things at the, at the raster timing level if you want to do something fancy. So those are the things that are the same as um, uh, 80s programming techniques. Well, it's now the glittering future, so some things are actually different. We're, we're, we're 30 years on. One thing is that we used to have to write an assembler, but now we can just write in high-level languages. Arduino has a, um, a pretty functional compiler and development environment based on what they call the wiring language, which is really C++. Something which would be quite puzzling to 80s people is how much storage we have available. This, these slides here are running off SD card with one gigabyte of memory on it, which by 80s standards is a ridiculous amount of memory. So uh, we, can do things, we can do things that would have uh, amazed those people, like have a whole set of slides on a single computer. 
the other thing we can do, of course, is we've got giant computers available, which 80s people didn't have. They often had to develop on the machine itself. And we have enormous compute resources by their standards. So this, these images you're looking at, which have, which have been converted for tile-based graphics, uh, the math of that is quite complicated. And these images take about, on a desktop CPU, take about 20 seconds to convert each. If we were doing that with an 80s computer, assuming you could find one big enough to do it, it would take about a month to convert each image. So there's a giant difference in what we have available today. And there's a reason why 80s people used artists to generate their careful background images. But some things never change. So we have same algorithms. Our actual experience of coding for it is exactly the same. Uh, you know, you, you want to do something, you have to decide which algorithm you're going to do it. And there's a, some algorithms don't fit because you don't have enough memory, but an awful lot of stuff is absolutely the same. If you have an old computer, it is um, exactly based on exactly the same mathematical principles as a modern computer, so there's no real a difference there. You certainly get a lot more math with a modern computer, but the principles, of course, never change. And the other thing that's exactly the same is bad taste is, ne is always with us. So if, uh, as you're making aesthetic decisions on uh, what looks good, provided the machine has some kind of um, threshold for what it can represent, uh, you still have to make taste decisions. If it's, for example, a one-bit display, then you, your decisions are fairly restricted. But as soon as you get into color and a reasonable level of um, pixel density, then you have all sorts of freedoms to make terrible-looking displays. <laughs> OK, so on to the actual hardware. So like a lot of old, those old machines, it is tile-based. So there's a tile plane in the background. And uh, this tile set. Does anybody recognize the tile set? That's good. Yes. So here we go. It's, uh, there's the first level. We're swapping in tiles on the right-hand side. There's a scroll register. It's quite striking how little memory is actually changing. Each, each strip of tiles that being, is being painted down is 22 bytes. That's not a lot to be, to be shuffling there. And there we go, there's the end of Mario's world. Lots of repeating elements. And of course, tiles and uh, Mario's world were really made for each other. The whole idea of tile hardware is to paint a world like this using the meager resources of an 8-bit MCU. Uh, but tiles are interesting and can do more than that. So here's a slightly different way of, of just arranging the tiles. There's two, five, six tiles in the machine because they're a byte each. We've loaded up all two, five, six with a, with a repeating image and then used the scroll registers to shuffle that across the screen. Obviously, it can't repaint every pixel every frame, but it does have a scroll register so it can shift the screen across. There's the Y scroll. Uh, but all we're doing here is changing one register, the scroll offset. So it's actually possible to move things relatively quickly using those, that XY scroll register and just zip around this virtual space at whatever speed we like. Tiles, I uh, revisited, of course, with this because tiles have kind of gone out of fashion. We don't use tiles very much. These days, we're just all about loading big images and 3D. But tiles were invented by this guy, Mr. Sebastian Truchet, about 300 years ago. He pointed out that with uh, just a relatively small tile set, here's his basic set. Uh, you can arrange them in all sorts of interesting ways and get um, a variety of results depending on how you place your tiles. So he's very interested in repeated tilings of a plane, uh, causing headaches. Uh, so there's a lot of options, just using those four basic tiles. And there is um, a random selection. So every tile is just a pick of those four, and you get, obviously, chaos. 
300 years later. This is an album cover by um, a pixel artist called Ilke, who actually did, did uh, my logo as well. And he's used the same uh, tile set. He's used colored tiles. Uh, so he's using a few more alternatives, but I think he's using about 20 different tiles to create his whole um, album cover, uh, using more or less the same technique as, Ms. as uh, Sebastian Truchet. And of course, this is now very famous, another, another tiling, uh, using these two tiles. For example, uh, we can uh, fill the plane with a random choice of zero or one. There's tile A, we're taking the zeros, and then as soon as we swap in uh, the other tile, something happens and we can no longer really see it as that selection of zeros and ones. We see it as a, as a, giant, um, as a giant maze. And that's because the tiles um, each connect one into the other, and it's, it's, it's impossible to look at this and not start to see patterns and routes through the maze because of the connectedness of those two tiles. So tile-based graphics are great for messing around with simple tiling schemes. Here I've taken um, tiles which, if you look at them, will actually connect one to the next four tiles and then just fill the plane with uh, tiles like this uh, randomly chosen, so the tiling is infinite in that it never repeats, and with a bit of color rotation you get a uh, never-ending journey. Okay, um, on to sprites. So this is a giant sprite, and here we've got background graphics, and foreground graphics, right? So these sprites are loaded. So the Gameduino has a bunch of sprites. Uh, it has, uh, in fact, uh, typical um, mid-80s machines just had a handful. We have 256 on the Gameduino because it was just possible to just keep on adding them. We've got a lot of CPU power on the, on the chip to actually do the um, sprite mixing. So it's got 256 sprites. They can all go anywhere. And they're all 16 by 16 pixels. And here they've been loaded up uh, to hold this block image but if you saw the animation a moment ago, it was a uh, rotating block. So we've got the blocks, and we can actually draw them at any angle. So obviously, the next step is to do that. Right, so all the MCU is doing is loading up those sprite positions. It's not really drawing any pixels. Whoa, OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is more sprite stuff. Uh, this time, loading up the sprite images with 64 versions of a ray-traced ball. Uh, you can kind of see that uh, uh, Gameduino doesn't have um, any soft edges. Every, um, transparency is all or nothing. So when I flip on the transparency bit here, right, those 64 images are still there. Just that orange color has become a transparent color. So this is the 64 basic sprites. And there's no, um, there's no smoothing on the edges. It's all... Um, all or nothing on its um, transparency. But we can still um, keep things moving when we do the animation and kind of try to hide that blockiness. So uh, we've got 64 images. We can mess around. We can load them up with different palettes. So we can take the original sprite images and just by changing the palettes get a um, selection of four different colors. And these are that's the full set of sprites. So this is all 256 sprites going on the screen at the same time. The MCU is, all it's doing, the uh, Arduino, all it's doing is writing to um, a sprite table. So it's writing x, y coordinates into the screen, which even the, the MCU is not a powerful machine. It's an 8-bit, um, 16 megahertz uh, CPU, but it has no trouble at all updating 1K of memory with um, XY coordinates. So it can move things around pretty fast. Uh, so here we've got all 256 just laid out on a big grid, uh, showing all four palettes. But we can actually position them in any. In any order, right here, it's just bouncing them around the screen all independently. And just by altering the code, we can make them do anything we like. And this is as fancy as it gets, really, with 
with the Arduino. Right, it's doing the 3D math and then it does a back to front sort so that the, uh, so there's a depth effect. And it's keeping them moving, you need to keep things moving fairly fast to sort of hide the uh, jerkiness of the um, pixel coordinates. And there you go, that's sort of 3D on old hardware. There's more stuff on the board. So we've got the background layer, the tiles, the, uh, the sprite layer, but there's a third thing on the, um, on the uh, hardware board. There's room to fit in a small dedicated CPU, a bit like the Amiga's copper. It can access any register on the machine. It uh, runs synchronous with the pixels, so it's a 50 MIPS, one instruction per cycle CPU, which is a lot quicker than the actual Arduino. Uh, it's a 16-bit um, stack machine. And uh, its only limitation is that it has a very small code space. There just, there just isn't enough memory on this, on this board to actually put a giant program in there. So it can only run a tiny fragment of stuff. So it's good for doing just a single effect. And then uh, if you want to make it do something else, you have to swap out the code and, and uh, switch to another mode. So, It has access to everything on the machine. So while the MCU is updating video memory, the coprocessor can be updating video memory. There's no restrictions on the timing. There's a, there's a system, uh, an interlock system, just so they can actually cooperate. So the program that's running right now on the screen is um, very short. All it does is take uh, random values from the hardware random number generator and copy them into tile memory. So that's where this snow effect is coming from. It's just loading up tile memory with random numbers continuously in a loop. Uh, so the Arduino actually isn't doing anything. It's just waiting for me to press a button right now uh, because the uh, onboard coprocessor is updating video memory uh, like crazy. There's the code for the random program. So as you can see, it's just a few bytes to get these random uh, tiles flashing up. So there's plenty of room to do other fancy things in the coprocessor program. So 256 bytes, no, it's not very much, but it's plenty to do something relatively interesting. Okay, so I've got a, a, I've got a few demos to show. That was the bouncing ball. So that's a, the, um, the grid is just uh, tiles, obviously. There's a bunch of sprites which um, sprites are 16 by 16, so to make big sprites, you just uh, use them in a grid, lots of them. And the ball animation was done using our palette rotation, which again is, a, is an 80s style trick of putting an indirection, a color indirection in the hardware so you can update every pixel without very much work. So Arduino, again, no trouble, it just moves the XY for the sprites and um, animates the palette. Uh, I was a bit shocked coming back and looking at the original Amiga demo that, that the ball was unshaded. It would only used three pixel values. It used transparent, black, and white. And it does not look that great. So when I redid it, you can see I did a sort of lighting effect on the ball just because to our modern eyes, the Amiga bouncing ball demo does not look especially impressive. So. Okay, chess is just a natural for this sort of graphics hardware. The, um, the chess board is a pair of tiles. Obviously, all the black tiles are the same, are the same uh, memory and all the white tiles are the same memory. Uh, the two chess sets of chess pieces are two sets of sprites. Um, the same graphic for each one, but using two different palettes. Uh, easy enough. The only problem is that, that the Arduino really doesn't have enough memory to run a um, a chess program. So this is just uh, playing back a, a single chess game. I have not got <laughs> uh, actual chess running. So this is the big demonstration game, which was a, um, a sort of, I guess the closest relative is something like Atari's Blasteroids. It's a sprite-based um, shooting game. All the um, rocks in the foreground are uh, sprites being rotated. <laughs> 
tile-based background. Uh, the stars are, um, are random tiles, and I was surprised to find out that you only actually need six different tiles in order to create a fairly, um, um, a fairly uh, random-looking star map. Six is all it takes if you choose your six tiles carefully. Oh, and, and a seventh tile with no star in it. And you just scatter those across, and there you go, a random universe. So it scrolls the background, it runs the sound system. It, um, uh, the thing it does give a good workout to is to the built-in collision detection system. We've got pixel-perfect collision detection. As we're, as we're drawing the sprites, we keep track of which, which pixels collide. So, yeah. OK, so that's Asteroids, uh, which like I say, it was, was the actual um, game to test out the platform, which is um, uh, actually had to make sure that it could actually play some real game, and it found quite a few things. That... Uh, does anybody recognize this? This, was... no. this is from um, Britain in the 1980s. annoying game where you jump around <laughs> caves. I don't know what happened to caves. A lot of games used to happen in them, but I guess they've gone out of fashion. Uh, what, I, I, of course, saw this as a child, and that's why I, I, uh, I wanted to remake it. But I was actually, I'd never noticed when I was playing it how few tiles the game actually uses. It, I think it uses six, maybe seven different tiles in its play area. There's a, there's a piece of ground and a piece of brick and, and a conveyor belt, and that's about it. So. It's, um, example of design minimalism, which I hadn't noticed before. Okay, that's all I have on Game Duino. Um, I have a couple of uh, units here if anybody wants to hack on them. Uh, thanks very much.